Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Uh, whoever that was, wow, they're really good. <laughs> if you're new with us, my name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And on behalf of our leaders, our staff, and all those who call Zion home, uh, we are so glad that you are here with us. Today is the end of our God Is series, where we've been exploring, walking through the Lord's Prayer to understand God's heart, to get a sense of what God desires for you, for the world, and everyone around Him. But more importantly, it tells us who God is. Now, each week we've been going through step by step the Lord's Prayer. And so I'm going to ask us one final time, would you please stand with me and we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together. Would you join with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hopefully they're going to get that ringing under control. I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, last week, we looked at these last three parts of the Lord's Prayer, which actually aren't in the teaching that Jesus gave us, but are found throughout Scripture, which if at the very end of it, it says, for yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and today we're going to be looking at God's is the glory. And I'm going to be honest, uh, this is really an important one for us, because in the midst of things going on, how many of you have ever wrestled with how God gets glory through things like cancer. Anybody ever struggled with that one? Or if you've ever read the Old Testament, I know I've talked to many people who are not Christians and they'll struggle, or people who were raised in the church and have walked away from church, and what they say is this, Jason, I do not know how to reconcile a loving God with a God in the Old Testament who commands war. When you see genocide taking place, I don't understand how God is glorified by the hardening of Pharaoh's heart and the death of the firstborn. I don't understand how we can even say God is glorified through the death of Jesus. Glory is one of those things that, for quite frankly, it's struggling for many of us in the church, including myself. I got to tell you, about five years ago, I went through a deconstructing of my faith. Now, here's the thing. I know that right now, statistically, there are some of you in this audience that have been systematically deconstructing your faith, meaning that you took maybe what you were raised in and you've begun to question not only the authority, but whether or not it's true. Now, I, I want to tell you that that's not always a bad thing if you do it the right way. See, when I went through my deconstruction, I was still a pastor. But what I did was this, is I, instead of coming into saying, I want to get rid of it all, I want to tear it down, I started looking at my faith through a different lens, which was this, how much of my faith have I actually owned? How much of my faith of what I believe about Jesus, what I believe about the Bible, what I believe about salvation, did I just simply believe because somebody taught it to me and they were good intentioned, loving people, my pastors, my youth pastors, mentors, how much of it did I really wrestle with? And so I began to kind of work through this, and I, I want to paint a picture for you, okay? Imagine for a moment, if you're packing to go to the beach for the day, you're going to pack certain things, aren't you? You're going to pack towels, and hopefully you've already got shorts on, but maybe a change of clothes, sunscreen, a sun hat, an umbrella, if you're going to an actual beach where there's sharks in the water, you might get a bodyboard or a surfboard. But you're going and you've packed your car, prepared to go on that journey. But now here's what I want you to think about. Now, let's suppose it's six months later. And now this time you're actually packing to go to the mountains. Here's what happens for many of us in our faith. And this is how this connects with God's glory. When we look at our faith, a lot of times what's happened is this, is that instead of us maturing with our faith, wrestling through our faith, we just kind of remain stagnant in our faith. And then when those big questions come up, we're not prepared to deal with them. 
it's kind of like this. It's like going to the mountains, but you're still packed for the beach. What it means to truly, in a healthy way, to deconstruct and reconstruct faith does not mean that you throw it all out. It means that you take out the things that were not necessarily healthy or that were not helpful, and you put them in light of Scripture, and you allow Scripture to speak for itself. One of the ways that I've talked about this is it's letting Scripture breathe. Now, I was raised in a church tradition that I'm incredibly grateful for. I became a Christian going into high school. And we had a love for the word, but there were a lot of things in there that sometimes were very shame-based. In fact, a lot of my faith was rooted more in behaviors than in God's goodness. That the end goal was about me becoming a better person, a more moral person, as if somehow if I lived the right life, that that would make God happier and I would achieve salvation. As I got older, I started realizing that that Faith was actually tying me down. It was weighing me down. I was going into new stages of my life and that what originally brought me into faith wasn't helping me carry into the next part of my journey. So what does this have to do with glory? Well, if you were raised in the church, you've probably heard all kinds of phrases about glory. There's a song, a really old one, To God Be the Glory. I love that song, by the way. One of my favorite hymns. But how about this? We need to give God all the glory. So what does it actually mean to glorify God? And what does this have to do with reconstructing or understanding our faith in a deeper context, in a deeper way, preparing us for a new season? Now, I want to tell you here at Zion, we give you permission to wrestle with your doubts and questions. If God's not afraid of your questions, neither should we be. Amen? And this is one of those ones that sometimes people wrestle with. So what does it actually mean to give glory to God? Well, in the English language, it simply means this, to make something famous, exalted, to give high praise, to give distinction, to make above. Now, here we've come to this end of this incredible gift of the Lord's Prayer, this gift that Jesus taught us, what I actually should be called, I think should be called the Disciples prayer. And there are some parts of it that are incredibly beautiful. There's almost a, a poetry to it. Now, others may see this gift of the Lord's Prayer as maybe historical value, or maybe it's just a beautiful, eloquent way of praying. But for those of us who follow and believe in Jesus, it is an entirely different kind of gift. It is a gift that reminds us of not only who God is, how faithful God is, but more importantly, whose God is. That he is our father. We belong to him. For disciples, it's a snapshot of our identity. Now, if you were to focus on every word, every thought, every strategy, every intent of each line of the Lord's Prayer, this is a really a prayer that tells us God's love for the world, God's love for his people, God's love for us, but also God's love for you and me. And if we're honest with ourselves, we quickly realize that this prayer is both powerful and beautiful, but we actually don't deserve it. I've not earned God as my father. I've done nothing to merit it. Just like my children, my daughter Indy just turned 14 yesterday. Lord have mercy. And, and I'm, i got to tell you, it's been so fun. My, over the last couple of years, my daughter has really blossomed and growing and watching her become a young woman of faith who loves Jesus. And she's just like every kid has got her own struggles. But I'm now entering into this new phase where I'm realizing that my daughter is growing up. And my job is to help her grow up. Amen. That's a parent's job. The Lord's Prayer is actually the Father's job of helping us learning how to grow up in him. And it starts with us realizing that we don't deserve one single piece of the Lord's Prayer. That's why it's a gift. It's a grace gift. It's rooted in the power of the gospel. We didn't deserve Jesus, God become flesh. We didn't deserve the gift of his life and death. And don't forget the most important part, his resurrection. We didn't do anything to earn that. We don't deserve his love, compassion, and mercy. 
But here's the thing. His love, compassion, and mercy is his character. It is the character of the Father. We don't deserve his kingdom to be citizens of it, but that's what he's done. He's invited us, calling us from the ends of the earth to join him. We don't deserve the provision, the giving of the Father, but here's the thing. That's what fathers do. I love my children. Yesterday, as we celebrated Indy's birthday, We actually did it over two days. Why did we do it? Not because she earned it, but because that's what fathers do. That's what mothers do. That's what parents do. We love on our children, not because they've earned it, not because they've deserved it, but because they are our children. And for those who confess their faith in Jesus, they are made children of the living God, brought into a family far bigger than most of us could ever comprehend. We don't deserve God's forgiveness, but he gave it anyways. We don't deserve his protection or his leadership, but here's the thing. That's what shepherds do. Shepherds lead and protect their flock even when their flock bite. We don't deserve God, a God who fights for us, who rescues us. But our God is a warrior king. And when we look at God, as we understand the Lord's prayer, we see this picture of a God who loves us. Now, I don't say this to bring shame to anybody because the reality is the Lord's prayer is not meant to make us feel small, but to help us realize how big God is. And we're called to be in awe of him. We don't deserve it. We haven't earned it. But he did it anyways, because that's what love does. See, when I was wrestling through my deconstruction, so to speak, why I struggled with God's glory and fame is as that I, I see this picture of a God who is loving and gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. That's how the psalmist describes it. That's how Moses describes him. But when I looked at the world around me, when I looked at a lot of churches, I didn't see churches that embodied the love and grace and compassion of God. I saw a lot of condemnation and shame. And more importantly, I saw a lot of those aspects in myself where I was quick to point fingers, quick to judge. And yet here I am, I'm reminded, wait, all this is supposed to give glory to God. How how does that bring glory? Listen to what Paul writes in Romans chapter 3. Then what can we boast about doing to earn our salvation? Nothing at all. Why? Because our acquittal is not based on our good deeds. It is based on what Christ has done and our faith in that work. So it is that we are saved by faith in Christ and not by the good things we do. See, when we look at the life and death of Jesus... If you're an an intellectual person in any capacity, I bet you many of you have wrestled with, why did Jesus have to die? Why did God have to send his son to die a horrific death on the cross so that we could be made right with him? Couldn't there be a different way? Couldn't he come and maybe like, you know, prick the finger and this blood's for you, just a little bit of blood, right? Could that have been it? Is there something else that Jesus could have done? Why couldn't God simply forgive? Now, this is a far bigger question than many of us realize, especially for those of you who have been wrestling with Scripture. Because when we read the Old Testament, we see all kinds of things that don't always line up with our view of a loving God. Let me give you some examples. How does God get glory by telling Abraham to take his son Isaac up to a mountain to be sacrificed? Do you guys know the story? God gives Abraham a son. Abraham's really old. God gives him a son. And then he says, hey, Abraham, I I want you to sacrifice that son. And so Abram goes and brings his son Isaac up to a mountaintop to literally sacrifice him to God. Or how about this? How is God glorified through the plagues of Egypt that lead to the death of the firstborn or even wiping out of the Egyptian army in the Red Sea? How is God glorified through all of the stories of war and genocide before Jesus? Better yet, how is God glorified by the horrific and tragic death of his son Jesus on the cross? All things that I've already alluded to. 
And if we want to make this even more relevant today, and I've talked about it at the very beginning, how is God glorified through the heartache of things like abuse, tragedy, sickness, and disease? How is God glorified through things like cancer? Those things give us pause, don't they? And if you've been wrestling with that, I get it. And so does God. Some Christians try to gloss over all of these things to avoid the, the hard conversation, to not talk about the difficult things, because we don't always like the hard questions, but that's why we actually pray the Lord's Prayer. Now, let me, I'll make a connection, I promise. See, here's the thing. The Lord's Prayer isn't just a prayer, it's a confession. It's us coming to Him, getting past the cliches, the trite statements, and actually saying, God, I need, to, I need you to do things that I cannot do. I need you to help me understand sometimes the most difficult things. How are you a loving father? And the best way to do that, to answer these, is to actually understand what the word glory means. I mean, we use this phrase glory. We just had the Olympics. How many athletes were competing for Olympic glory? We have the flag called old glory. We struggle with understanding what glory is because we've not rightly understood what God means by glory. We've twisted it in our humanness to simply mean fame, to something that everybody seeks or desires or glory. So let me give you two biblical examples or words. One is in the New Testament. One is in the Old Testament. See, the understanding of glory that we're most familiar with is the word doxa. And in it, it's where we get the word for praise, elevate, to exalt, or worship. But it's not a unique word to Christianity. In fact, you got to remember, Christianity was a small movement in the Roman Empire. They did things in the Roman Empire for the doxa of Rome, for the glory of Rome, for the glory of Caesars. When gladiators would compete, they would compete for glory and fame. And quite frankly, it's why most of us seek glory is to be made famous, to have a name made for ourselves. But the Old Testament actually has a very different understanding of the word glory. And I think when we look at the Old Testament, what the word here for glory is and what, where it came from, it gives us an entirely different way of understanding who God is, how God is glorified through things that don't make sense to us. See, the word in the Old Testament for glory is kavod. And kavod didn't start off by talking about fame or power. It was originally used in monetary the idea was this. You guys all know the scales of justice. You know that scale where you have the, the two sides, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? When something weighs heavier, what happens? The other side lifts up. Well, originally, money was not determined by face value, meaning like we have our $1 bill, $5 bill, $10 bill, $20 bill, $50, $100. They are all made out of the same material. What gives them value in our culture is the denomination written on them and what that denomination represents. But in the ancient world, before they could do that, what determined something's value was the weight of it. So if something weighed more, it was worth more. The word kavod literally means to weigh more than. That if you were to put the scale of something in two glories, whatever weighs more is worth more. And so here we have this word kavod, which the idea is to give God greater weight than anything else in the world. Does that make sense? You guys tracking with me? If you were to set up a scale in your heart to give God glory means that whatever else is there, God will always weigh more than that thing. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Weight of Glory. In it, he says this, We do not want merely to see beauty, though God knows, even that is bounty enough. We want something else which can hardly be put into words. To be united with the beauty we see, to pass into it, to receive it into ourselves, to bathe in it, to become a part of it. For God to receive glory means 
that he is worth more, that he is heavier than anything else. Another way of saying it is, is he is a heavy God. Now, I've shared this, uh, the first time I saw my children was the first time I think I can kind of compare this understanding of glory. See, I used to think I knew what love was. Kind of like a Peter Cetera song, right? The glory of love. I knew what the weight of love was. And I remember the first time I kissed a girl, Wanda Weldy. That's right, her name was Wanda Weldy. Her brother's name was Wiley Weldy and her sister's name was Wendy Weldy. Yep, they had a trend. It was a whole thing. And I remember my first kiss and I was like, oh, this is love and like nothing compared to that moment, right? And then I remember started dating and then I remember meeting Lisa. Lisa and I met when we were 15. We met at a Bible camp. We didn't date for many years. And then I remember going, once I knew Lisa was the one, that's true love. Real love was when I looked at my wife or the soon to be my wife and I go, I love this woman. I want to marry this woman. And then I remember on our wedding day when we said, I do, and we made a covenant with one another. I'm like, oh, that's love. And then we had the wedding night and I was like, well, that, that's love. And then <laughs> picking up what I'm dropping, it's all good. We're, we're adults. It's all, it's all good. And I thought I knew what love was. Each time, the glory of love weighed a little bit more. And then I remember the first time I held my daughter. How many of you guys remember that moment as a parent when you first held your child for the first time? Anybody raise a show of hands. Do you remember that feeling? I thought I knew what love was until I held my daughter for the first time and I realized I would give anything for this little girl and she's done absolutely nothing. For the first time in my life, I understood unconditional love. Now, I want you to hear this. I love my wife more than I love my daughter. I do. I choose my wife over my daughter. That's how we're supposed to do it. And guess who I love more than my wife and I love my daughter is I love Jesus more than any of those things. See, the weight of the glory of love changed with each encounter. Well, as us as Christians... Our encounters with God are supposed to help us understand the weight of God's glory in our lives. So let's go back to those earlier stories. See, in the Old Testament, the weight of God's glory literally came down in a physical form like a cloud. In Exodus 40, Moses has finished the tabernacle. This is the place where God is going to dwell with the Israelites in the desert. And wherever God's presence is, it comes down like a cloud and it fills the place. And when the, the cloud moves, they move. Israel is following the glory of God. It comes down like a thick cloud. And as the tabernacle is built, they go into worship. But the cloud, the thickness, the heaviness of God's glory is so rich, so heavy, they can't even enter into the tabernacle. Literally, the weight of God's glory is that heavy, they can't even enter into the place where God dwells. And you see a similar picture. See, David, and I talked about this a few weeks ago, King David wanted to build the house a permanent home. God, a permanent home. See, the tabernacle was a moving, it was a tent that moved with them. David wanted to build a temple. He couldn't build the temple because he was a man of war and God is a God of peace. So he tells his son, and there's this beautiful moment when the temple is finally built. And as they're coming in, you get this echo, a very similar scene where God's glory comes down in a physical manifestation of a cloud and it envelops the temple of the Lord. And all you see is the thickness, the heaviness of God's glory in this place. Um, about two and a half years ago, a group of us went down to the Send, which was a, a conference down in Orlando. And we, it was a day-long conference of worship and prophetic prayer and God just doing some awesome things. Now, there's video of this, and I've got other people that were there, so if you don't believe me, I think you can still see it online. The end of the, we get to the night, it had been hot all day, sun was out, and it was, I mean, it was hot all day. We get to the night, it's starting to get dark, and they're singing this song. And it's talking about, let the glory of the Lord fall on this place, send your rain. And all of a sudden, it starts to rain. But check this out. 
it only rained in the front row of where the stage was. You're watching on the cameras and there's literally rain falling on the worship leaders and on the front row, but it's raining nowhere else in the auditorium, nowhere else in the stadium. And we're just sitting there. I'm like, I turned, I think I turned to Matt Cook or somebody. I'm like, is that rain? And literally they're singing, fall on us, Lord, fall on us, Lord. And there's physical rain falling down. And I'm like, this is amazing. Watching just the glory of God come. And here's the best part. As soon as they finished the song, the rain stopped. Now, I struggle. For years, I've struggled. Does this stuff happen? I've seen God do this. And in that moment, what I was reminded of is this. God can show up when and where and how he wants to. Amen? We didn't command it. We didn't dictate it. It was something God chose to do. If God wanted to right now, he could do that same thing for us. Why he doesn't? He knows, not me. I'm not trying to seek the experience. I'm trying to seek the giver of the experience. Does that make sense? I'm seeking the God who brings glory because he's worthy of our glory. This heaviness of God helps us begin to repack the car, so to speak. See, what I had to do from my childhood is I had these images of God and I would say things that I thought were mature sounding, but I never really wrestled with them. And then when I got faced with things and, and for those of you, my, my wife and I, and I think I talked about this a few weeks ago, um, we're coming up on the six year anniversary of my mother-in-law's death from cancer, October 31st. And I can tell you, we prayed every night for God to heal her of cancer. And when she died, there was a wrestling of faith. And in that moment, I remember my wife talking about this and I've shared this story a few times. It was harder for my wife because for her, she had been raised in a family where if you prayed it and believed it, God would do it. And God didn't do it the way we wanted him to. And it caused a wrestling in faith for her. And I had that same wrestling. It just made it manifested in a different way. See, when we look at God's glory, when we wrestle with these things, we have to ask, what does it mean to actually give God glory? And here's what I hope to do in these next couple minutes. I hope that I can unpack this and maybe help some of you who have been unpacking, maybe repack some new views, new perspective on why God does what God does and we don't always understand. First of all, we need to realize, recognize the only reason God needs to be glorified in the world, whether back then in the time of Jesus, in the time of Moses or Abraham or even now, is because of sin, but even more direct because of idolatry. Idolatry is giving more weight to something, someone, or somewhere than God. If that scale in your heart existed, idolatry is saying money weighs more than God does. Idolatry is saying my happiness outweighs God's. Idolatry is me saying my Lutheranism matters more than God. See, at the end of the day, we don't go to heaven because we're Lutherans. We go to heaven because we love Jesus. Your children, your spouse, your hobby, your job. Idolatry is on that scale of your heart. What weighs more? See, if who God is was on one side of the scale, his character, his kingdom, his provision, his forgiveness, his word, the things he has done in the world and in our lives, what should happen is this. When we fully comprehend just how good God is, just how big God is, nothing should weigh more than God in our heart, in our mind, in our lives. But that's the human struggle, isn't it? I can't tell you how often that I let other things weigh more than God in my mind. That I let the struggles of my day, of my week get in the way. And here's the thing. John Calvin, a theologian and pastor in the 16th century, he said it this way, the human heart is an idol factory, which means that our hearts, because we have this sin issue in us, is really good at consistently putting things in front of God. It's just our nature. It's our brokenness. But that's not 
how God handles our brokenness. God gets glory through our brokenness in different ways. Listen to what 2 Peter 3.9 says. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. See, when we see this picture of God in the Old Testament, who is a God of war, we see a picture that Peter describes of a God who desires that everyone comes to repentance. God does not delight in bloodshed. He's heartbroken by it. Right now, um, some of you might be aware of what's going on in Afghanistan. America is pulling its troops out of Afghanistan, and as a result, the Taliban is coming in. And the pre- I just got word in the news that the president of Afghanistan has left the country out of the threat of Taliban. God's heart breaks because of that. God's heart breaks at war. God's heart breaks at bloodshed. That is not who God is. God is a God of life. Luke 20, 38. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For to him all are alive. From all of those understandings. Now let's go all the way back to what we talked about at the very beginning. Those first couple ones. See, when we read the stories of God telling Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. Here's the thing. Abraham was surrounded by all different kinds of gods in the ancient world. And every single one of them were gods of war and bloodshed. In fact, it was a common practice that you should sacrifice your firstborn to your God. So in Abraham's mind, when Yahweh says, hey, I want you to sacrifice your son. Abraham's like, okay, that's what every God tells him to do. But there's this beautiful scene while walking up the hill. Isaac turns to his father and he says, Dad, where are we going? And Abraham says, we're going to sacrifice. And Isaac looks and says, but where's the ram? Where's the, where's the sheep? Where's the thing we're going to use to sacrifice? And Abraham, because he knows the character and the heart of God, says these beautiful words to his son. I don't know, but God will provide. And as they get to the top, He's about ready to sacrifice his son, thinking that's what God wants. And what God is really doing is showing that he's unlike all the other gods in the ancient world. He is the one true living God. And as Abraham is ready to lift up his knife, just as he's about ready to bring it down, God, an angel of the Lord, comes and says, stop. And all of a sudden, Abraham looks over and there's a ram caught in thicket. God was trying to prove something about his character. He's not like the other gods. Even in Moses, when Moses is dealing with Israel or with Egypt and all the things that are going on there, God is not delighting in this. What we see is Pharaoh has a hard heart. Now, you may not know this, and I believe it's in our notes in here, but each one of the plagues, every single plague, represents one of the gods of Egypt. And here's what's happening. This is so cool. Every plague is God showing that he is more powerful than that particular God of Egypt. He is actually saying that Yahweh weighs more than Isis or or Cyrus or Ra. Every single one is God saying, no, 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 I get the glory. I weigh more than they do. I weigh more than Pharaoh. I receive the glory. God did not delight in those things. He was heartbroken, but he demonstrated his faithfulness to his people by revealing his glory to them. And when you repent, if Pharaoh had repented, none of the judgment would have come. Or how about Jesus? When Jesus died on the cross, you want to know what's more powerful than the gods of Egypt, of Babylon, Persia, and Rome? Or how about the idols of money, fame, power, sex, your house, your car, your hobby? There is something that's more powerful than all those things, sin and death. Every single human being has been plagued by those two things throughout history. Sin and death are more powerful than any of the ancient gods. You want to know why Jesus went to the cross? Jesus went to the cross, yes, to pay the penalty, but more importantly, to show victory, to show that he weighed more than sin and death. See, when Jesus died... He paid the penalty for our sin, but when he resurrected, he declared victory over it. Amen? 
He received glory in that moment because what he showed was is that even on the cross, God is bigger, heavier than they are. The Bible tells us that the wages, the payment of sin is death. Well, Jesus paid that in full, completely. There was one person who had never sinned, and that was Jesus. There was one person who could have escaped death, but chose it. That was Jesus. He chose to submit himself up to it for one reason, to make his glory known. Because even Jesus, God's son, could not escape the impact of sin and death. For us as his disciples, 1 Corinthians 15, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Now here's what I believe. We're wrapping up. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up here in a minute. See, here's what I believe happens. I believe that those who are in Christ do not actually experience the sting of death. I believe that just before death comes to the body, that the Holy Spirit grabs our soul and our spirit so that we never taste death as believers. And I believe I can support that in Scripture. That's why you hear stories of faithful men and women who love Jesus right before they die. And some of the last words they say is, Jesus, God in Christ, we escape death because God gets the glory. See, when it comes to things like cancer, how is God glorified with cancer? Through abuse and war and violence. I want you to hear this. God hates cancer. He hates sexual, physical, emotional, spiritual abuse. He hates racism, sexism. He hates war and violence. But he gets glory through it when those who are the victims of it don't give it more power than it deserves. When those who are in Christ do not give in to bitterness, rage, anger, hatred, unforgiveness, and retaliation. Now here's the thing. If you're dealing with those things, if, you, if you're feeling any of that, we have this incredible gift that we just simply have to confess and repent and we're forgiven. Instead, God has shown glory through the gospel of Jesus, through the character of God, by showing his mercy, justice, and compassion, love, and grace that conquer all. It's the cancer patient who shows that God weighs even more than the disease ravaging their body by still choosing to worship and praise God. Now, here's what I want you to hear. If you're struggling with that, that's okay. God understands it. If you're wrestling through cancer, and maybe you're, you're struggling through it. I, I think about my sister, Mary Graham, who goes to Zion, who has been faithfully loving and worshiping Jesus as she's been battling cancer and her faithfulness and the witness that she's been. But that doesn't mean that she doesn't ever get angry or isn't afraid. It means that she understands that God weighs more than cancer. Amen? God is heavier than the cancer. His glory is greater. His worth is is better. That's how cancer doesn't ultimately get defeat because this is not the end. This is not the end of the line for those who are in Christ. We believe in eternal life. All of us are going to die someday. But in Christ, when we die, it's not the end of our story. It's the end of a chapter. God gets the glory when we give him more weight, not because God delights in it, this is how we can pray Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been according to his purpose. See, even when you've been a victim of abuse, if you've been sexually abused, emotionally abused, maybe you're dealing with a divorce or there's stuff going on in your life, you have a God who wants to meet you in those moments and who is simply asking you to do one thing, Surrender. Let the Holy Spirit work in and through it. It's not a promise that life gets easier because one day, one day it will. That final day is when Jesus comes back again for the final time when we see that Jesus comes to restore things to back to how they should have been in the beginning. 
We see this in Revelation when God receives the final glory. I just want to read this to us. Would you stand with me as I read this last scripture? And we're going to prepare our hearts for some final worship. See, one day, God is going to receive the ultimate glory by showing that he is heavier than everything else in the world. And what he's going to do is this. And it's this beautiful picture. Jesus returns and the kingdom of God, heaven comes to earth and the two unite. The world becomes how it was supposed to be. Every tear is wiped away. This is Revelation 21.4. I heard a loud voice said from the front, uh, shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. All these things are gone forever. Now listen to these last words. You ready for this? Check this out. And the one sitting on the throne, the one who is the heavy God, declares this. Look, I am making all things new. God is going to one day make everything right. And when he does that, that final victory, that final declaration, the scales will finally be tipped. And all of creation will see that nothing weighs more than God. That God receives all of the glory, all of the fame, all of the honor. He is a heavy God. And we are his people. God doesn't go on diets. <laughs> he delights in his heaviness. He delights when his people say, God, I choose you. I choose to give glory to you instead of my problem. Even when I don't understand it. I choose you over my anger, over my hurt. Here's what I'm going to ask. As we sing this closing song and as Megan comes up, if you need prayer for healing in your life, I feel like the Lord's doing something right now. If you need prayer, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to ask you, we've got a prayer team. I'm going to ask you to come over to our prayer team, to our staff. If you're battling an illness or a hurt, come and receive prayer. But here's the final thing that you and I can do and all, it's giving glory to God. We're going to lift our hands, declaring the glory, the goodness of God. And we're going to sing the blessings of God of God over us. Receive this song as a blessing and a promise to you. But first and foremost, it's not about you. It's about Jesus.